and uh, today is August 12, 1994. I'm speaking with Clint Olson at his home in Bend, Oregon, about his experiences with the Shevlin Hickson logging camp. This tape is number one of the Shevlin Hickson Brooks Scanlon Oral History Project, and it belongs to me. Okay, uh, how long have you lived in Bend, Clint? We had to move to Bend uh, in 1956 after they closed the Brooks Scanlon logging camps. Okay, uh, and I, I you kind of answered the next part of the question for me, which was that I understood that you grew up in the Shevlin Hickson uh, camps, uh, and do you recall what the period of years was that, that you were out there? Well, I was born in Portland due to some complications in my birth. I was a large baby, over 11 pounds, and wow, so nice. cesarean birth, and... Uh, Shortly after my birth in the St. Vincent's Hospital in Portland, uh, we came, we returned to Bend probably a couple of weeks after I was born, which was June 24th, 1926. Okay. Uh, you know, over, over that period of years that you were uh, in the camps, uh, do you remember, you know, oh, what the average population of the camps might have been. Did they fluctuate in size? or? Well, uh, when Shevlin Hickson first started logging out of Bend, Oregon back in the uh, early 20s, they had many camps. They had Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3, Camp 4, and then sometimes the camps acquired names like uh, Camp of the Long Garage, or the Spring River Camp, mm -hmm. but up until 1936, all they were they had many camps. I would say at least two or three in the uh, early or late 20s. And in 1936, when we moved to the uh, Lapine Camp, the one that was three miles east of Lapine near the base of Finley Butte, they uh, incorporated all the camps into one big camp. And that was 1926? 1936. 36? 36. For okay. the Lapine camp. Okay. Uh, and so, in all of these camps that were out in the woods, then what size do you think those were? And, and were they family-oriented also, or were those... Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the types of camps they had, but I believe they were. And uh, I, I said 36. I probably uh, 32 was the time we moved to into the Lapine camp. I believe. I'm not certain about this period because I was pretty young. Yeah. Right. And uh, but they did have. Uh, camps where the uh, bachelors, bachelor loggers, were. The background noise and the banging that you hear on the tape is a young child banging on a door. Okay, I'd like to focus uh, this portion of the conversation on your family life, and I'd like to begin by asking where your fa where your parents came from, and how they happened to come to work for Shevlin Hickson. Uh, my father grew up in Frazee, Minnesota. Um, his family there, well, they were the H.M. Uh, Olsons of Frazee, and they ran a photo studio and took portraits of people. And my father worked uh, his way through. Uh, high school and he told me that he used to go down the road 10 miles every morning and milk 10 cows. You know that's funny because my father told me he walked five miles down the road. <laughs> that's always a big distance. Yeah, barefoot. And 40 below. In the snow. Yeah, yeah, 40 below zero. No, but I guess he did go down to his children's farm in, in Frazee and that was one of his uh, chores that children did back in those days that they don't do now. Uh, he milked cows and 
he got a little income out of that. And after he graduated from the Frazee High School, he went to work for Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark, one of the companies that made the move, mm-hmm. part of the company. That, that was the parent company, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. uh-huh. in Frazee. Mm-hmm. And uh, he worked for them as a uh, lumber stacker at first, and there he met uh, and worked with a friend of his called Vern Johnson, and uh, Dad did the piling of the lumber, and Vern was able to count the uh, number of wards. They call them the tally whacker. Mm. They use what they call a tally whacker. Uh-huh. And Vern Johnson became the, later became the chief inspector of the Western Pine Association. He wrote the Bible on grading pine lumber. Well, what time, uh, uh, what time do you think this was in terms of the century? Um, my father was born in 1896, so you could just calculate from that. Okay. Uh, you know, it would be... Uh, would have been about, what, 1816 or... No, well, uh, it would have been before 19, that. 19, yeah, I'm sorry, 1916. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he would... Did he make the move out? Uh, well, he went, to, uh, he went to World War I mm-hmm. from Frazee. And uh, he was in the Signal Corps, which later became the Air Force. Mm-hmm. But and before he went into the, the First World War, he was working for... Uh, uh, Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark. Clark. And uh, he, uh, when he returned, he no longer had to stack lumber, but he became a, uh, a camp clerk. And he would visit the various camps. And they had a number of camps. Uh, in the uh, Minnesota area where they they cut the logs and skid them out onto the ice and then when the spring thaw they all ran down to the mill. Well what did what did the camp clerk do? <laughs> well he kept track of the time usually. He's a timekeeper. Yeah they, they didn't have social security then so right. there were no real good records but um, he did take care of uh, the uh, time for each individual man, and he also was a liaison between management and labor, oh. and uh, the ombudsman, as they call him sometimes. And uh, he did the ordering for the for the camp uh, cooks and uh, the warehouse, and he he probably had a lot to do with the warehouse end of it, mm-hmm. making sure that they had adequate supplies at all the cabins. Okay, so he would be the one, for instance, who might order uh, all the canned goods or even, uh, you know, plates, dishes, things like that? He told me the story. They had inadvertently ordered a, a whole boxcar of uh, rutabagis oh. and <laughs> they uh, cooks cooked them and they just couldn't get rid of them. Nobody liked them. So he told me about using a little psychology in getting rid of this excess of rutabagas. He went to the camp and sat and ate with them and he said, Boy, you guys, you better take it easy on these rutabagas. You know, they cost a dollar a sack. <laughs> with that little information, the loggers inadvertently decided they were going to break the company eating rutabagas. <laughs> so they they got so they managed to get rid of their excess in rutabagas. How about that? <laughs> he just had to give them the information that they were expensive. Yeah, and and anything that cost the company money. It's got to be good, huh? Yeah. Well, they like to... Make the make the company pay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, was there any ever you know back in Minnesota? Did you know that kind of makes one wonder? Was there ever any problems between labor and management, the uh, labor disputes or anything? He or? never mentioned anything yeah. like that. I mean, it seems like back in those days it was more like uh, management was the hierarchy. You had to look at them up on the pedestal and. There's a poor laborer down here, and there's no in between. Mm, okay, yeah. And no unions. 
A lot of movement, you suppose, as far as the workers uh, sort of thing? Uh, I think when they would sign on, they would be working for most of the winter mm -hmm. in, uh, in one camp. A lot of hand labor, a lot of people working there. But if they didn't like the show, they picked up and moved on to the next one. Yep, because there was always work available for anybody that wanted to get out and work. Yeah, whether it was Shevlin, Carpenter, or Clark, or somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Brooks Scanlon, I understand, started up in the northern part of uh, Minnesota, up in Blind River, International Falls, up near Bemidji, in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, what about your mom? Did your dad meet your mom out there, or did he meet her here? Or? My mother uh, was uh, one of uh, five girls in uh, their family, and uh, they uh, she had a French Canadian mother, and a uh, her father worked for the Canadian National Railway, and she was born in Canal, British Columbia. But because her father was an American citizen, working as a conductor on the CNN, she naturally was an American citizen. And uh, they moved to Vancouver from British Columbia, from uh, Quinal, British Columbia, which is way up the Fraser River, down into the Vancouver area. And they didn't like it there. They were my grandmother, my mother's mother, was uh, really afraid of gypsies mm. trying to steal her daughter. Mm. And they'd come by and beg food and put chalk marks on the gates of the houses and she'd go out and rub all the chalk marks off. But uh, they moved later to Portland and she grew up in Portland and uh, southwest Portland and uh, she went to school at the Holy Name Society and later became a a teaching, uh, what do they call them, teaching nun? Or, oh. She wasn't a nun exactly, she was a teacher, mm -hmm. a lay person that was a teacher working in the Catholic Church. As okay. a, yeah. So so how was it then with your father back in Minnesota and your mom in Portland that they happened to meet? <laughs> well, my father, after he became a camp clerk in Minnesota, they, uh, he was offered this position about 1919 uh, when he returned from World War World War One, and uh, they said we're going to be building a big mill out at uh, Bend, Oregon. Would you like to go out? And I guess he said yes. He, you know, he was interested in doing something new and different. So that was probably though before he went off to the war. Since, since they made the announcement uh, that they would be opening in Bend around 1915. Yeah, they, well, he went to the war and, and got back to Minnesota from the war. Mm -hmm. In 1919, he came to Bend, which is after World War One. Right, and after the bill or the mill had already been built. Oh, and they built yeah, they've gone through the process of building a mill, right. and they were looking for re recruiting people that would and, help them out here. And so, your dad had, uh, oh, obviously he had impressed the, the Shevlin, Carpenter, Clark people back in Minnesota, and so they were interested in bringing him out here, or did he ask to come out here? I'm not sure. I believe that they asked him if he would like to come out, and he said yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, he came out in 1919, what they call the winter of the blue snow. Huh. Robert? The winter of the blue snow. Yep, the uh, snow got over eight feet deep on Wall Street. Uh -huh. They had to tunnel into the different different stores and buildings. Uh -huh. How about that? The snow was so deep it looked blue. <laughs> After coming from Minnesota, he thought he was coming to a paradise and uh -huh. <laughs> ended up in more snow than he'd ever seen in Minnesota. Uh -huh. What a, a twist of, of fates there, huh? Mm -hmm. So. So, okay, your dad moved out here then to Bend, and your mother was still in Portland. Yes. Okay, and so how did they meet then? <laughs> um, her father quit the, uh, the uh, 
railroading and I guess he was a good cook and he they were looking for cooks and he my mother's father applied as a cook in one of these logging camps mm -hmm. here, Bill here in yeah, William Colross I mean, yeah William Colross was his name and uh, he started to work for Shevlin as one of their camp cooks and since he had these daughters they had a lot of opportunity to hire a daughter as a waitress my mother came to Ben as a waitress huh. okay so uh, your mother's hired on yeah. as a waitress and uh, she came to Ben with her sister Annette uh, my mother's name is Florence and Annette and Florence rode on the train from Portland to Bend and I can remember Annette saying to the conductor how come this train goes so slow it goes so slow the moss grows on the tr on the wheels <laughs> <laughs> and it took them quite a while it took them almost two day trip to get up here from right. Portland by train and and but when they got here they or their dad already had a, a job waiting for him. Yeah, well... So did they hire out of, like, a clearinghouse in Portland, or did he... No, I, I think he... I, I'm not sure of the details, but I believe that he just told the company that he had a daughter that could be a waitress here. Mm -hmm. And that was probably back... That was in 19, 1919 or 1920. Mm. Right at the end of 1919 or the beginning of 1920 because we have I have some of those pineapple right magazines right that talk about Clint Olson going from camp one to camp two or okay now that was that was the Shevlin equalizer yeah, yeah pineapples right. was Brooks Gamble that's right yeah hey, okay. you got it yeah. okay well I just I wanted to make <laughs> I sure check I, it. <laughs> okay. yeah well you did good you caught yeah you you're you almost caught me on that one uh, <laughs> Okay, so your mom came from Portland then, and your dad from from Minnesota, mm -hmm. and they met in one of the camps there. Is that yes. correct? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned that your your mother was uh, hired on as a waitress. Her dad was the cook. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at that time, you know, some of the and I I just want to ask this question because of the terminology that I come across and. And Pacific Lumber Congresses and, and uh, various publications, uh, loggers referred to. What did did loggers have a particular name that they referred to people as waitresses? I can't remember. I I wasn't. Uh, you know. Okay. The the thing that comes to mind for me, and maybe it was different for for women than it was for men, but the term I remember is flunky. Oh yeah. Does that uh, ring a bell? That's one of the words that they use for people that did insignificant jobs around. Something outside of the yeah. woods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, okay. Uh, yeah, and of course, apparently there was a, you know, a, a, a different way of looking at the cook mm -hmm. as opposed to the way they looked at waiters and may, or, or waiters. And maybe that term, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm unsure, maybe the term was more for male waiters rather than for uh, the, the females that, that I, I recall my mother telling me that uh, they would sit down for uh, breakfast and uh, she would pour these coffee cups these real heavy white ceramic cups mm -hmm. full of coffee for each of the individuals they would sit at these type of picnic tables I think there was uh, six or eight men at each table and she said it really frustrated her when they'd take the first cup of coffee and throw it under the table after it warmed the cup. Because they wanted it hot, huh? Yeah, and the uh, end, end result was a sloppy floor. Of course, uh, they, they kept the place meticulously clean. I'll bet. And nobody frowned upon a, a logger doing that, huh? Well, yes, my mother did. Your mother did, but, <laughs> yeah. but what, nothing she could do about <laughs> yeah, that, right. except just say, hey, don't do that. And, uh, okay, huh. that's interesting. <laughs> so uh, then your mom and dad must have met at one of these camps. And yeah, oh, yes. Struck uh, up a he, friendship was a, he was a camp clerk or timekeeper, as they called. <laughs> 
and uh, and she was a waitress working for her father. And I'm not exactly how they did. I didn't uh, was wasn't cognizant of the exact details of how they met, but they started going together, and uh, they hit it off pretty good. And uh, I guess that uh, according to the Equalizer, they uh, spent about six months in their engagement, and then they got married on the 26th of June in 1920. Uh-huh. And did they go on a honeymoon? I don't believe so. Don't believe it. They, they always talked about going to Hawaii for oh, a honeymoon. Okay. But I don't believe they ever did. She she went back and, and went to work then in the, the cookhouse as a waitress, and your dad continued on as the timekeeper and put the, the honeymoon off till later. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh... Let me just ask, any brothers or sisters? No. No, you're a single child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, were, was there any extended family in the camps? Uncles oh, yeah. and aunts? Uh, yes, I had an uh, alcoholic uncle. <laughs> uh, well, in fact, both of my, uh, my grandfather, which was a cat cook, this was your mother's father. Yes, uh -huh. Bill Colross. He was a camp cook, and he was my mother's father. He had rigged up a still on the stove, the big lang, mm -hmm. a wood-fired stove. In the back of it was a still that took care of all the cuttings from fruit, especially peaches in Africa. Uh, well, was this during Prohibition time? This must have been oh, during... Oh, sure. Okay, okay. So he had an illegal still out there. Well, yeah, it was right on the back of the stove, okay. and the uh, and the superintendent, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, oh, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he used to show up and and ask Bill if he had any any good good brew off of that uh -huh. little still, and he'd he'd serve you some. Was this superintendent's name uh, his last name Meister? Meister. Meister. Jack Meister. Jack Meister, that was the fella, huh? Yeah. How about that? J. H. Meister. Right. Yeah. Well, did your did your grandfather supply any of the loggers with any? No, of it was more for his own personal. His own personal. Yeah, I guess he was able to get rid of most of the production. He and the, his close friends got uh -huh. rid of all the production. It was just a small scale. Yeah. I, as I understand, it wasn't much over a gallon. Uh -huh. But the superintendent didn't seem to have any aversion to it. Apparently, your grandfather was a good cook. Oh yes. Uh huh. And uh, uh, Mr. Meister wanted to be sure that he stayed around to keep the men happy. Yeah. You think so? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's so. So your grandfather was there. You say you had an uncle. Was he? Did he work in the camps also? Yes. He was a uh, hard rock miner that came from uh, came through Denver area up in uh, Pikes Peak and that area. And he was a construction type worker. He worked on the building of the. Uh, the railroad into Bend from uh, Shears Bridge. Oh yeah. And uh, when he got here, he 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 found his brother here, and and they, he decided to stay in the logging camp. And he worked as a one of the individuals that supplied the lump the uh, the wood to fire the log loaders. They would uh, bring in a load of pine logs and uh, dump them right next to the McGifford that was, log that was loading the log. Okay. And they, uh, my uncle Frank would buck uh, or, or saw with a crosscut, buck the uh, pine logs into four foot pieces uh, and then split them and load them up on the uh, Rack so the firemen could continue firing the the McGifford to produce the steam to load logs. Right. Okay. Uh, was there? Do you recall a particular name that that his job was called? No, I can't remember any okay. name for. Okay. Uh, but he was the one who who cut up and split up the wood to they, be. They probably call him the bucker. The bucker, huh? Yeah. Okay. Log bucker. Okay, so 
mostly then it was your mother and father and your grandfather and uncle that were and you were all in the same camp together yeah or they were all in the same camp mm -hmm. together yeah okay and then later my grandmother moved here after Robbie that's enough after uh, mr. Uh, my grandfather William Crowers died in 1925 and then my grandmother moved up here from Portland this was your mother's mother yeah yeah mm -hmm. she didn't she didn't choose to live in the camp oh yeah she she moved into the camp then uh -huh. and uh, she had uh, I th I'm not uh, really sure of how this happened but uh, it must have been in the early 30s that she moved into camp because she had remarried mm -hmm. in Portland. Mm -hmm. A fellow by the name of Bert Bowman. He worked for Bink Beacon's Van Story oh, okay. in Portland. And he moved to camp with her, and uh, that way she was close to my mother, and mm -hmm. it made a small circle of relatives. Sure. And and then her new husband, your grandmother's new husband, he did some kind of work in the woods. Yeah, my step grandfather. Uh -huh. Yeah, he he was a mechanical. Okay. Well, oh. when your when your mother's father died, and your grandmother was living here with him yeah. in in the camp. Yeah. Okay. You know that's that's kind of a raises a question for me as far as you know it was it was a company owned camp correct I'm yeah correct in that. Uh -huh. so uh, when your grandfather passed away what did your grandmother do then what did they was she allowed to stay in the camp or well uh, I, I think I got the uh, sequence uh, wrong here my grandfather passed away in 1925 and I don't believe my grandmother remarried until about 1928 or 29 in Portland and then she moved to uh, the camp with my step uh, grandfather Bert Bolden okay so so was she not living in the camp then with your grandfather no not okay uh, she he was still in Portland okay with the other four girls oh, oh okay so <laughs> so your your grandfather your mother is father yeah had a home in, in portland, portland. Yeah. okay but he also lived in the camp and then he would apparently go into portland yeah at various times and and on holidays or vacation mm -hmm. uh, well what would they do in a case like that where your grandfather was was the cook uh who would do the cooking when he was well gone? they'd always have a second cook they oh, call him okay and how how often was your grandfather uh did he go to portland I'm not sure about that, yeah. but I'd probably say maybe once a month or once so. Once a month, okay, yeah. for a weekend or a week, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's you know, let's talk a little bit then, as uh, what how things were for you as a boy. You know, uh, uh, did life ever get lonely as a boy living uh, in this community in the woods? What was no, it? no. Okay, it was exciting. Oh, I, I, I didn't know anything different than camp life. I, I didn't realize that people had sidewalks and streets, because and, where I grew up, it was always dirt roads, and, and uh, I felt l later on that the people in Bend felt more superior to the people who lived in camps because we didn't have all the amenities that the people in Bend had. Uh -huh. But I realized that we had a, a closer association with each other in the camp. It was more like a huge family. Mm. Of course, there was some outlaws in the family, sure. too. But uh, Well, how about kids? Were there generally a lot of kids in the camp? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, do you remember... Uh, oh, we were playing. We played lots of games. We used to... We used to uh, dig tunnels in the soft uh, pumice dirt. It was real simple. We'd dig a series of tunnels and cover them with burlap sacks, and, and uh, it was real, real neat. You'd, you'd 
you'd put blind alleys and places to hide from other people. And we went to a lot of labor just to enjoy a little bit of, of excitement that way. And Did you have bicycles out in the camp? Oh yes. Uh -huh. And it, and you, where did you ride them around? Well, on the main on the main roads in camp, that was always well packed and well graded. Sometimes it'd be a little washboarding. And, and uh, when we were down at Lapine Camp, we'd even go up as into Palina Lake. Our camp was located at about 4,000 feet and Palina Lake about 7,000 feet. Yeah. And it's, it's quite a hill. You can re yeah, they burn. I burned out brakes coming down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, were, were childhood friendships, uh, were they fairly stable or did uh, friends tend to come and go? Well, uh, no, I don't think we all went to school in the same bus, and uh, of course we were the camp kids. We were clickish that way, mm -hmm. and within that click, there were certain little cliques developed. Where, you know, uh, some of the kids that played basketball were more, more or less, held off different from the, the other kids that weren't able to compete in sports like that and uh, I, I wasn't too athletic and I didn't I kind of resented that fact that I wasn't in the the top click with all the big shot yeah. athletes <laughs> so so most of these kids families then they they stayed with the camps it sounds like for years uh, oh it, yeah it doesn't sound like there was a, a whole lot of movement no no uh -uh. okay there, uh, was, there was a big influx of people from Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, right after the war, the, what do we call the Okies and the Arkies right. moved out. And uh, a lot of them had wood experience working in the woods from Arkansas and Oklahoma, so they were able to get jobs out here. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, they were absorbed pretty well. There was a few that never were absorbed, absorbed into the General Ryan And why do you suppose, or who do you suppose these people were that they weren't well absorbed into the community? Well, some that were too much, much of an outlaw type of person. They, they, if you didn't fit in with the whole community, and I, it's kind of an unusual way that they seem to have their own social. Uh, laws and regulations in that camp. They were able to get along great with Czechoslovakians, and of course, the <laughs> some of the people referred to the people from Croatia and Czechoslovakia as bohunks, <laughs> which is a real derogatory term nowadays. But uh, well, even back then, I guess it was. But uh, but we were. It seemed like we got along good with the, the people from Croatia, and uh, in fact, they became some of my best friends. So, but, but there was a, a little, a small group from Arkansas and Oklahoma that just they were unsightly and unclean and unsanitary, mm, and, that, and they finally were asked to leave because they weren't. You had to be fairly clean and live clean and, and, you know, and if you broke the rules, they'd ask you to leave. Who, who was it that did the asking? The uh, camp supervisor, uh, Mr. Linton, Robert Stanley Linton. He, he lived in Bend, but he spent a lot of time in the camp. Uh, so uh, for him to request that these people leave, how how did that process occur? Well, it was usually a group of people or a number of people. You know, they'd just go talk to Stanley and say, "Well, you know, let's get these kids are out pooping in the yard, and we don't like it, and they're pooping on my porch." <laughs> you know, things like that. And after a while, if he gets enough reports like people like that, he'd ask them to leave. You know? uh, sure, sure. Well. 
you know, you, you mentioned Bulgarians and Croatians. Uh, were there a number of different nationalities of people who worked in the, the camps in the woods? Oh, recall? yes. Yeah. Well, can you uh, tell me something about them? Well, there was uh, the Sawfeller, who was referred to as Scotty, because he was a Scotchman. <laughs> Scotty McKenzie, he filed saws. Excellent. Sawfiler. And he came from Scotland? Yeah, he came directly from Scotland and ended up here in Bend. And there was uh, a lot of Swedish people from Minnesota, you know, Swedish. How about, how about yourself? What's what's your your stock? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Norwe half Norwegian and half French and half Scotch. Okay. <laughs> my mother and my uh, my grandmother and mother were French, and, you know, and uh, and William Coloss, I guess, was Scotch. So, what would you say the the largest group of a nationality in the in the camps were? American. <laughs> okay, that's that's not believable. Well, what would be next? <laughs> well, I I think uh, there. Uh, when they first started, a lot, lot of the people here were just Norwegians and Swedes. Okay, so, so Scandinavian. Yeah, yeah Scandinavian type. Or many Finns. Were predominant. Very few Finns. There was a few, but not too many. And so there, so there were Swedes and Norwegians. There were some Bulgarians and Croatians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about Hispanics or Asians? The only Hispanic you could call it would be the uh, the, the Basques. There, there was a few Basque sheep herders that would come into camp and probably stay for a time, and some of them, some of them would go to work when they're off season, I guess, for sheep herding. And, but uh, there was hardly any uh, any uh, Spaniards or Mexicans. No Mexican, no black. The first black I ever saw was a shoe shine man that had a shoe shine parlor next to the Capitol Theater in Bend, Oregon. And I thought he had a heavy tan. <laughs> <laughs> and and no Asians to speak of. Oh, there was a few. Um, the Asians were mostly in the cooking end of it. But uh, with our with Chevlin, I can't remember any Asians be being right in the camp. There may have been. I'll have to think about that. Okay, so if these if these folks these Asians were associated with the cooking end of things in the camp, uh, you're unsure where they lived though. Well, they, everybody lived in the camp, and uh, the bachelors lived on those railroad cars that had uh, space for, I think it was six, the cars were 60 feet long, and they had uh, six uh, individual bunk rooms in the bunk house, and they were about 10 by 10. Uh, how did, how did the, the other folks in the community, you know, how did, how did they feel about uh, I guess what we call these minorities. Uh, did the did these folks keep to themselves pretty much, or well, yes, and and they spoke their native language a lot, and uh, and some of the people that worked with him, some of the like my cousin from Portland, he came to work here in, in uh, the camp, and he worked with a bunch of Croatians, and he. He was able to pick up on their language and and speak their language with them, and he learned their language just so he he liked them and he fit in with them. What what did was there a particular line of work that the Cro Croatians did? Uh, usually, now you gotta be quiet. Usually, they were involved in uh, track laying and steel, what they call a steel gang. Now, a steel gang is different from the gandy dancer or track maintenance. The steel gang laid the steel. They prepared, they had a grade crew that prepared the grade for laying the steel tracks. And then they had a, a group of men that worked 
with a track layer, a machine that laid the, the steel tracks down. Okay, so the Croatians were more involved with the uh, construction of the, the railroad grades. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and the building of the tracks and, okay. and the retrieving, you see. That's right. what they would do when they, they were track logging. They would lay steel in the morning and then their engine would take the track layer back to a area that's already been logged and pick up the steel. How about the Bulgarians? Yeah, uh, they were they were involved there too okay. with the same. Okay, so the Asians tended to be more associated with uh, the cooking end of things, and the Croatians and the Bulgarians were more associated with uh, the track laying and the railroad great construction, yeah. and the Scandinavians and yeah. Americans were more woods oriented. Yes. Is that, uh -huh. that the way it was? Okay. Robbie, you got to be quiet. If you're not quiet, you got to go outside. Okay? Okay? And, but all of these people came and lived in the same camp. Oh, yes. Yeah. But in that camp of La Pine, uh, the uh, seniority ruled in the location of where you were allowed to put your house, and the oldest men were able to pick out their spot first. And they usually got closest to the store and closest to the post office and, and closer to the facility. Mm -hmm. And then as it developed, the Croatian-speaking people kind of congregated in the southwest corner of that camp. And uh, they were all neighbors of each other. And how about the Bulgarians and the, the I, Asians? Yeah, I, I, I can't recall an Asian being in camp, really, I can't. I, I said Asians because I know that some of them come by, and, and I don't recall them staying. Yeah, okay. Uh, did did the Bulgarians or the Croatians, did they also have their families, or were oh, they yes. mostly bachelors? Oh, they, they, most of these people had large families. Mm. And that's the ones that we went to school in the Rio speed wagon that was bought for the by the uh, company, I guess, for the children of the of the Lapine camp to carry them to the Lapine schools. Okay, that was uh, it had leather seats. It was built like the old dollar line, like the one that Marilyn Monroe was in that movie. You remember? No, I don't. Uh, one of her first movies. They had this big square bus with the luggage rack around the top uh -huh. and uh, it uh, it held 75 kids. It had a, a bench seat and extended clear around the perimeter of the bus. And this was all leather covered and then the, the uh, kind of pew seats up the middle. See? Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, it sounds like you know, the people who were living in the camps, working there, uh, they were mostly family people. Were there not many bachelors? Oh, they, there was a group of bachelors that, that lived in their own section of camp. Since they moved the bachelor bunkhouses on rails, and the, uh, the family houses were skidded to the location, and there was no rails involved where they were. In that earlier picture of uh, Cliff Camp, you can see where they, they simply set the family house off of the rails. So the family houses went down the railroad track. In the Lapine Camp, they were skidded to a location in a, a camp plot where we had four main streets, first, second, third, and fourth street. And there was houses on each side of each street where the Bunk houses were all in the very east end of the camp, and they were still on rails. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, individual uh, that lived in these bunk houses, they had to walk up the steps. They never, they never lowered them. They weren't lowered down to the level of the ground. They had to go up a series of steps, about eight feet, to get to the get to the bunkhouse. Uh, uh, you know, what, what was what was the stability of, of the bachelors? Did, 
were did they stay in the camps as long as the family folks did or oh yes mm -hmm. they did or they didn't tend to move around or anything no uh, they uh some of them had worked for Shevlin for 20 30 years and never they never married uh, they didn't have a family or a wife and kids somewhere else or well so, a few did that i know of but uh some of them had people uh, like they had referred to it back in the old country, or, or back in Yugoslavia, or, or back in Europe. Robbie, be quiet, please. And they had send their their check back there, and or part of their check. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, I guess my reason for asking is because, you know, in looking, oh, through quite a bit of the the literature. The impression that I get uh, from that literature is that there seems to be quite a bit of turnover in the bachelors. Uh, it's, they were an independent group of people, and it's kind of like the old saying, you know, if they didn't like the movie, they, they got up and left. They yeah. went to the next show. Uh, right. n none of that uh, sort of situation at Shevlin. Uh, it didn't seem like uh, Shevlin was so maternalistic. You know, you were working for Shevlin, and Shevlin will take care of you. Okay. That you got that feeling after you've lived there, and nothing is going to happen because Shevlin is going to take care of you, and all you had to do is work. Let me just review a bit about what we've already talked before we continue on. During the 19 teens, through the 1920s, and into the 1930s. Uh, there were numerous logging camps operating in the woods for the Chevron Hickson Company, is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and then around 1932, or thereabouts, the camps were consolidated into one large camp. Is that, uh, is that right? Yes, at the uh, base of Finley Butte, three miles east of Lapine. Okay, and so from that time on then, they were large, separate camps, and but they each had a name. Yeah, well, they just had the one camp. Each time they moved, it was just one camp from then, from then on. Uh, but they went by like the Lapine Camp. Yes. And some Summit Camp. And Shemol Camp. Shemol Camp. Okay, but <clears throat> even with these individual names, they did they fall under kind of the heading of the community of Shevlin? Yeah. Okay, so... I live at Shevlin and Camp. Okay, yeah. so whether it was Lapine or yeah. Summit or Chamolt, it, it was Shevlin. It's Shevlin. Okay. And that caused a lot of consternation with the U.S. Post Office because the Post Office moved with the camp. Yeah, right. And they say, you can't move a Post Office. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that created some confusion, all right. Uh, it, during that time, uh, from the 30s until, you know, the end down at Chamalt, uh, what would you estimate the average population of the camps once they'd become known the as The Lapine Camp had a, about 750 people. Uh, 250 were employees that were working in the camp. Uh, about, I'd say, 10 to 15 percent were bachelors living in the bunkhouses, as they call them, mm -hmm. and the rest were families. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and when we spoke earlier, in the camps there were a number of nationalities, most of whom were Americans and Scandinavians, mm -hmm. uh, but there were also, I believe you said, some, ba some Basques and uh, Eastern Europeans. Yes, uh, okay. okay. Uh, and Croatian. Okay, and the Eastern Europeans were Croatians and... Oh, I'm not sure of all the rest. You know, that area that they're fighting in right now is uh, where those people came from. And, and so Czechoslovakia. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to say because they changed the boundaries and they changed sure. names so sure. much. It, sure. it, it was Yugo Yugoslavia. Yeah, well, <laughs> in, in talking earlier, I, it seemed like I remembered you saying something about Bulgarians and Yugoslavians and yeah. Czechoslovakians, Croatians. Mm -hmm. Do those nationalities ring a bell? Yeah, or? They, they, they all were there. Okay. Not in, 
I mean, there wasn't very many. I don't, don't remember very many Bulgarians, but okay. I do remember a lot of Croatians. Okay. Uh, but you don't remember there being any Asians to speak of? No. Okay. There was okay. no Chinese or Japanese or Filipinos. Okay. Or Hispanics or that. No. Okay. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in the organization organization of work, it sounds like uh, the Americans and Scandinavians primarily made up the woods crew. They worked yeah. in the woods, and the Eastern Europeans uh, worked as steel crew, steel on the steel. Yeah, they they harder. Uh, well, I thought more difficult, but it paid good too. But also the fact that. There was a, what would you call it, a cadre of Scandinavians that came from Minnesota. That was the heart of the Shovel and Hickson Company. Mm -hmm. They moved out here with the supervisors and everybody. And they, of course, were the uh, supervisors and the foremen and everything else that came all the way from Minnesota to Bend. So in a way, would you say that you know, these were kind of a, a preferred group of people since they followed the company out? Yeah, well, well they were the, the people in charge. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, <coughs> discrimination, you know, it's, it's hard to describe what type of discrimination they had, but since they were the, the ruling class, <laughs> that was what it was. I yeah. mean, uh, the Scandinavians that came from working with Shevlin, Carpenter, and Clark, and Frazee, Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> would you would you say that the folks who worked in the woods, you know, the buckers, or fallers, or high riggers, or what have mm -hmm. you, that their work was generally more skilled than people working on uh, the steel crew? Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, that, that was a part of it also. Now, a steel gang was just a repetitious type of work where they laid the steel or railroad and then picked it up again. Okay, so for the most part then, <clears throat> if we said uh, that the Eastern Europeans were probably less skilled laborers, would you think? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, and so that's that's one of the reasons they yeah. were the steel mm -hmm. crew. Okay. Did this cross-section of ethnic groups remain fairly consistent throughout uh, the history of the logging camps, or did their populations increase or decrease um, over time? Back in the late 30s and early 40s, when the Dust Bowl developed in Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma, there was a large influx of what became known in this area as Okies come with their old broken down cars, old Model A's, and, and even like, well, take Mr. Hutzpah, he moved to Prineville. He didn't have any money when he got there. Mm -hmm. He became one of the richest uh, loggers in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you've probably seen his house for sale, a three and a half million dollar house. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> then what you're saying is that if if you were a, an Oki or an Arki and you came here to work, you wound up being a millionaire. Is that right? <laughs> no, hardly. <laughs> hardly. There was an opportunity for everybody, uh -huh. as Mr. Hutzman uh, uh, showed them. But, uh, but uh, the uh, most of them just got the menial jobs. A lot of them got the very, like, uh, swampers and hmm. and just help around camp and, and what the swampers do well they uh, cleaned up and made sure that there was enough uh, fuel for the people that worked out in the woods they'd uh, bring in a load of logs and buck it up so like the Eastern Europeans then the Arkies and the Okies were less skilled yeah most of them okay. unless they knew how to operate a type of machinery like a caterpillar and they could get in a, a, a lot higher paying job by running a cat. Okay, so, so these people then, because they, they lacked the skills, uh, were they more likely to move on more quickly? No, they, they, people moved into camp, they seemed to like it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those Arkies and Okies knew how to fall timber. Mm -hmm. Now that took them into a completely new 
weight scale because the timber fowlers became the richest as far as uh, hourly wage of the whole camp crew. Mm -hmm. They were they were the highest pay. When I introduced the power saw, about 1940, oh, shortly after the war, 46, say, they introduced the use of the power saw. And prior to that time, it was the old misery whip. Yeah, the old. They you know, used uh, Simmons. I saw a display in the war service, and they had saws and axes I'd never seen at Shovel and Hickson. Well, is that, well, what was different about them? Well, they were the type of falling axe they used over on the west side to have narrow blades for, oh. for putting in those steps to get up. And right, right, for the old girls. Yeah, and uh, the ones that I grew up with were Plum and Simmons. Plum axes mm -hmm. and Simmons saw. But these were cross-cut cross saws. Cross-cut saws. Used by two men. Yes. Yeah. Rule. yeah. It, just out of curiosity, uh, you ever familiar with the term called a rubber man? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, was that a common practice? Can, um, can you describe it? It wasn't a common practice, but there were some men that were able to use it. And it wasn't used uh, all the time. It was just uh, kind of an emergency type of thing where... Paul Peterson, one of the high rollers, or what they call high rollers, he was a top follower. And he liked to be the best follower and follow the most timber. But once in a while, one of his partners wouldn't make it, or he couldn't make it. And so Paul would use the uh, rubber man, where they just uh, drive a stake on one side of the tree and put an inner tube around the end of the the saw handle and Paul would be on the other side with his pulling the saw and then the inner tube pull it back. Uh -huh. And that worked pretty effectively, huh? Well, he knew how to do it real well. Uh -huh. And and uh, if, if you were kind of a reclusive sort of individual and you didn't like to take guff from your partner, a rubber man didn't have much to say. Huh? <laughs> That's right. But they didn't use it like that. It was just more or less a, an, emergency. an emergency. You usually had two men working together as a team. Okay. And they normally were good friends and it worked out quite well. <laughs> you know, oftentimes uh, I see bottles that were adapted, you know, to be hung on trees or something. Was there something in those bottles that, that uh, was used during the sawing process? Yes, uh, when they were using the old crosscut, they used to take uh, pint whiskey bottles. Whiskey used to come in pint bottles instead of four-fifths of a pint and four-fifths of a quart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a pint bottle, and they would uh, cut off a small branch They'd fill the, the uh, container with kerosene and stick a small branch with a pine needle pointing out. And then as they sawed and the pitch from the tree would start to gum up the saw, reach in their hip pocket, pull out the pint that had the kerosene in and just sprinkle the, the saw with the, with the kerosene. As a solvent. Yeah, and it, it, it made it go better, just like putting uh, oil on it. Sure. Uh, w was that a, a regular routine process? They, they have oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a matter of, uh, well, they only had to put it on once during the cutting oh, process. Oh, no, they'd, they'd put it on about every five minutes sometimes, okay. depending on the pitch in the tree and sure. how close they were to the root. When they are closer you get to the root, the more pitch you get. Yeah, okay. Well... Uh, you know, as far as the housing arrangements uh, go, you mentioned that the Eastern Europeans kind of like to keep to themselves. Uh, yeah, they, uh, and did did they have like a, a separate neighborhood of their own? Yes, uh, I don't know if that how that worked out. Uh, but when Mr. Linton, he was the logging superintendent, he was laying out the campsite. He would have a plat and. The location of your house was dependent on your seniority. And uh, it looks like they had 
they had four streets in the line, and the first house right on this corner was Stanley Lynn's. <laughs> How was this further away from the tracks or closer to the tracks? Or? Well, in that case, the tracks were way down here. They didn't interfere with the camp at all. The tracks went way up around the base of the butte. There. But right across the street from Stanley Linton was Harry Todd, my uncle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he had been with him for a long, long time. And then um, the Gumperts. Yeah, uh huh. They were kind of all together, uh -huh. and uh, the Eastern Europeans were back here in the corner. Okay, but they were closer to the tracks. Eh? Yeah, they were closer to the and, tracks. And today. these folks were about as far away from the tracks as you could get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and your uncle. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Your dad, for the most part, moved out with, here with the company. Uh, how did other people get their jobs with Shetland Hicks? And there was a, I'm not sure about that really, uh, but there was a nucleus of people that came out, and I think William J. Bear, Bell Bear, he was another one that was hired about the time of my dad. He was another timekeeper, and uh, there was a lot of supervisors that came out from Minnesota. And uh, I don't know if they hired the people here in Bend or if there was a group of them came with them, but almost all the supervisors came from Minnesota. Okay. If, if I were going uh, or looking for work in mm -hmm. 1930 uh, and I was a logger, yeah. uh, how would I get a job with Chevlin Hickson? You'd, you'd come to the office where my dad was a timekeeper. At the camp. Yes. Okay. And he would tell you that you had to talk to Stanley Linton. He was the logging superintendent out in the camp. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was usually out in the woods until about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he'd come in, and then he'd talk to him and tell him, tell him your story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some of them <coughs> had a good line, and some of them didn't. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I know a number of, of logging companies in the Pacific Northwest oftentimes used clearing houses, you know, like in Portland or mm -hmm. Seattle. The Chevron uh, didn't do that, but um, I think they also had a, a policy of, if you went down to the mill office uh, and you weren't looking for a mill job but looking for one in the camp, they'd send you out and let you talk to they furnish the transportation out to talk to the supervisor. Okay, see what they had going on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, why do you suppose Shevlin Hicks moved out here to Central Oregon? After all, they were a fairly large company back at the Lake States. Uh, what What do you suppose him told them to come out here? They They sent people out here that were like double lot seven. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, you've never heard of the uh, over oh, double seven, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, these were the cruisers, the timber cruisers, were the first ones to come out here for Gilchrist and mm -hmm. Shevlin and Brooks Gallon. Mm -hmm. And why did they come? Well, they they were looking for new places to log, you see. And when they saw that beautiful yellow pine or ponderosa pine out here on practically park-like areas. They said, this is it. And, uh, but they had plenty of timber back at the Lake States, and they wanted well, to they were running that. out. They, they realized were... they were running out. Uh -huh. so they, they knew that they had to find a new uh, market for So they needed to broaden their horizon. Yeah. yeah, okay. And eventually, you know, Shevlin developed one of the largest pine mills in the world, plus a box factory. They had a, everything came in wooden boxes back in those days. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, these timber cruisers are an interesting group. And they tried to conceal their identity mm -hmm. wherever they went. You never saw a company vehicle with a timber cruiser in. They always drove their own car, or the company would supply a, a different car for them to get out in the woods. So. 
as far as you know, or as well as you know, did Shevlin Hickson send out people with uh, the primary purpose of, hey, just go out there and yeah, buy the uh, land? Yeah, George Conklin and his brothers, okay. Ted, and I think he had two or three brothers. And they were all timber cruisers from back in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Joe Hayner, the famous Hayner Park, mm -hmm. uh, he was a timber cruiser at one time. And uh, the cruisers that worked for the Gilchrist Company wanted only ponderosa pine. So when they went out to purchase the land that had the best timber on it, they went right up to the face of the Walker Rim where the sudden change in altitude changes it from ponderosa pine to lodgepole mm -hmm. and you can just draw a line right where the right where the, the different varieties of timber change. Gilchrist took all the yellow pine or ponderosa. They didn't want anything to do with the lodgepole. Mm -hmm. So they're, they don't they even ever went up on top of the Walker Rim. They just stayed down at the base and took all the real good timber. Huh. You can follow their uh, their main truck road goes right along the base of Walker Rim today. Uh, let's see. Why don't you tell me a little something uh, about what the family houses were like when oh, they, uh, they were designed and. Our, the Chevron Hickson houses were of, uh, two before. It's called balloon type construction. They were uh, 16 by 22, and the foundation had uh, two 12 by 12 stringers that ran ran lengthways uh, under the under the house, and uh, they had a outside wall and the inside wall, which didn't appear in the Brook Stanton houses. They simply had the outside wall with the two before. So who did the maintenance on these houses? The maintenance was done by Chevron Hickson. We paid, the people paid rent for the houses. Mm -hmm. A very nominal sum, like five or ten dollars a month per house. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we moved into the pine camp, it became popular to have two of those 16 by 22 houses they would position them side by side with a space between them 8, 10, 12 feet apart and build what they call an in-between mm -hmm. so they'd have a large room between the two houses and these could still be transported from when well, you got ready to move to the next location? yeah, they, the company furnished the, the lumber to build them and as they started building and they realized if they built them strong enough they could move them mm -hmm. so the first few were not built that way so they just had to tear them out when so, they moved so the houses might grow from one location to the next is that right you might start mm -hmm. out with a well a 10 by 22 and then well no it, the, the individual houses were 16 by 22 okay. and they were uh, built and they had windows and, and they had two rooms is what they had and you could have two of those if you had a family you know and uh, an excellent example of the Shevel Hickson house is still out here at Pine Mountain Cattle Company they have one on the south side of the highway just before you get to the big barn there so then with the two of them combined it'd basically be a 36 by 44 foot structure well not exactly either it's, it's still got these two rooms with the in-between now the in-between could be divided or it could be one big room like a huge living room okay. or you know whatever setup they wanted to build in that in-between but at first like i said they were flimsy and then after they realized if they build them stronger they could move that like a house and it would belong to the people that, and if you sold your I mean if you moved out somebody bought your house you had they had to pay for your inventory oh okay <laughs> but 
you didn't own the house yourself. No, there. Uh, it was it was company property. That's right. And these were these were constructed though in such a way that that they could be transported yeah, from lifted. A, a flat car onto the mm -hmm. ground and yeah. then yarded to a particular location. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then and then kind of packaged back up and put back on the flat car and moved on down the line to the next location. Yeah, right? there was a great deal of tar paper involved when you wanted to put a skirt around the bottom of the house to eliminate drafts and things like that. And the company was really quite, oh, I'd say they're almost, uh, you're under our wing, you know, they're really paternalistic and, and as long as you're working for us, we will take care of you. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the tar, ta tar paper were, were the houses pretty well insulated. I mean, it got oh, cold out there. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, they had the regular four-inch wall. Mm -hmm. They didn't have insulation. Okay. But uh, people learned to insulate. The, some people would put insulation in the attic. The attic was easy, easily accessible. And were, were the houses uh, painted? or? Oh, they, yeah, they're all... <laughs> they're, Shefflin used Battleship Gray. <laughs> oh, they did? Every house in camp was Battleship Gray. And did they do the painting or did you? Uh, they did the painting. They did, every, periodically. Uh -huh. If you wanted trim or something, you did that. Mm -hmm. Any fancy part of it. They just did the the outside and everything looked gray when they got done with it. If you wanted to put a yellow or a blue or some or sort shutters of, or something. Yeah, uh -huh. that's up to you. Okay. Uh, what about plumbing? How was it? Um, up until the time we got to La Pine Camp, they had hydrants. A hydrant was a water faucet that was located between four houses. The houses, like, uh, well, on that cliff camp. I don't know if we, you have a picture of it mm -hmm. or I have. Yeah. The cliff camp, the houses were set off the spur. There was no rectangular pattern. It just followed where they laid the railroad tracks. Less organized. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they would try to put in a uh, hydrant between four different houses, and they, could, they had easy access to the water. Mm -hmm. When we moved to the Lapine camp, it was planned with the four roads that went down between the the houses were set up on each side of the road, but in front of each house, they cut, they put a uh, water main mm. down in front of the rows of houses, and each house had a individual water in the kitchen sink at first, mm -hmm. and then into the bathroom. So you had flushing toilets. And and yeah, later. Whereas at, at the earlier camp, like Cliff Camp. There, you had outhouses instead mm -hmm. of indoor toilets. Uh, what about, you know, since since you had uh, at Cliff Camp uh, prior to the 1932, uh, what about bathing facilities? Well, that was uh, where they used the, uh, the company had the bathhouse. Oh, okay. Which and consisted of how, how large a structure? It was a railroad car that was 60 feet long. And uh, I drew a picture of it somewhere. And, and uh, I would say 40, well, maybe 50 feet was devoted to the men. It had about eight or 10 shower stalls and some sinks and a deep sink and four or five flush toilets. And then on the women's side, I, I hadn't been there too, uh, yeah. too many times, but they had they had two or three shower stalls and one or two toilets and the sinks. <laughs> and that was used communally then? Yes. Uh -huh. and, and once you moved then... That was on a railroad car. You see, it was uh -huh. a railroad car. Uh -huh. but once having moved from Cliff Camp and kind of 
reorganized into these larger camps of Shevlin. And, mm -hmm. uh, you had indoor plumbing and you had your own family mm -hmm. toilets. The and bachelors still used the bathhouse. Okay, yeah, was, that was a communal thing. Yeah. The bachelors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the uh, one of the swampers, he he uh, kept the. They started with a uh, 300 gallon hot water tank mounted in the bathhouse and the water we had was really cold I mean that water that came down from Polina near Polina Lake it was about 40 degrees mm. and they had a huge stove made out of I think that stove had uh, had some uh, pipes in there to heat the water and it was made out of a 50 gallon oil drum you know and I it seems to me it was bigger than 50 it might have been two 50s together because they they threw a four foot piece of ponderosa pine mm. in there to, to keep the fire going wow. and they, they they would fall and split dry ponderosa pine for fuel for that in those uh, bunk houses and that bathhouse, they use dry ponderosa pine. Mm. So, you know, as far as the well, whether it was the bachelors or the family, how how did folks do their laundry? Um, the family houses, uh, well, uh, the uh, <laughs> the uh, bachelors, they they did theirs in the deep sink, or they. Or they had sent it up to some woman, mm -hmm. yeah, from some family woman in camp would do the washing for probably a dollar or mm -hmm. something like that. They had the old gas engine Maytags, and uh, you'd hear those old p -p 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 uh, those cast aluminum Maytags uh, with the ringers on them, uh -huh. and Monday morning you'd hear them all over camp. That was wash day. Yeah, <laughs> Monday was wash day. <laughs> and uh, uh, my mother was running a uh, coal, coal made a iron, gas operated iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, for ironing the clothes. And it says, do not use them in an enclosed place. And she didn't realize, and she passed out from the carbon monoxide. So after that, she was kind of wary of the. I can imagine the old yeah. gas. So, what kind of lighting did the houses have? Um, most of them used Coleman lanterns, and then uh, the Aladdin, Aladdin lamp that used kerosene was used because you didn't have to pump it all the time. Right, right. And I can remember my aunt and uncle using the Aladdin lamp right up to the time that they installed electricity. Now when was that? That was about 1948. Okay, so that was that was getting towards the end then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Let's see, uh, no, not 48. I'll have to change that because we moved down. I was trying to remember which camp it was in. We got electricity in the Lapine camp, so it should we started getting it before the war, so it was back in the 30s that we got they put in that BX armored cable. Okay. And was that gas generated electricity? Uh, yeah, no, diesel. Diesel, okay. Uh, primarily, mostly diesel. But uh, you know, later we, we joined the co op, you know, the mid state co op. And they furnished electricity. But um, I was trying to remember, uh, there was a few houses in Ben, I mean, in uh, camp that. Uh, Use the shell lane as a type of propane mm -hmm. where it had a mantle and mounted on the wall. And uh, we had it in our house. And they'd bring out these big, big tanks that were about two feet in diameter and about four or five feet long. Kind of like travel trailers. Yeah, the only they yeah. were bigger, a lot yeah. bigger than that. Yeah. And they used that for lights before we got the electrical lights. And the but the electrical lights came sometime in the 30s. Yeah, late 30s. Okay, and they were run by diesel. <coughs> A diesel engine, and they they got you see 
things like this where they decided to, to generate electricity. Uh, logging superintendent and the uh, logging manager here in Bend, they, they didn't have the knowledge necessary to really develop the thing correctly, but they went ahead and did it anyhow. Oh, okay. <laughs> so correctly. Yeah. yeah. They had talked to somebody down the mill who knew about electricity, and they would get. They ended up finally with a big hodgepodge of diesel generators. Mm -hmm. One of them was operated with twelve belts wow. <laughs> running a generator, and as luck would have it, the generator caught fire. The, the building, generator building, burned down. Mm -hmm and destroyed all this hodgepodge that they had of different size engines and everything. And they wised up and bought a Caterpillar electric set. Oh, okay. They bought two of them. They're uh, the equivalent of a D4 Caterpillar, which was a four-cylinder diesel hooked directly right on the drive shaft to a, a 50 kilowatt generator, which was rated at uh, 65 kVA. It could put out 65. And because of the size of the camp, they needed two of them. So they mounted two of them side by side in this uh, powerhouse, as they call it. And one of my jobs was when I was taking care of it, we had to watch the oil and the water and the temperature and watch the gauges. But if you had one uh, generator running and long about dusk you better kick in the second one well you had to synchronize them mm -hmm. they had to be on the same cycle so they had a board of about six or eight light bulbs that would light up and you'd start the one engine to match the one that was already running and this board would flash light it light and then it turn off, light and turn off. And if you had them out of sync, it would just flicker. Mm -hmm. And as you you would rotate the handle on the throttle until you got them, so the light would come on and then it'd go off. And then it'd be on for about a second, and then it'd go off for about a second. Then, as it was off, you slammed the main switch in. And they were synchronized. Was that something that uh, required somebody to be there all the time? Uh, oh, yeah. Kind of monitoring the powerhouse? Yeah, there was a, a person that took care of the steam locomotives also monitored the powerhouse. Okay. Uh, it, since it was uh, a company run electrical powerhouse, uh, was there a particular time when there was a lights out in the camp? Absolutely. Okay. When they first started, especially, you would take a switch and flash it. At 10 o'clock, you look at your, pull out your pocket watch. Or <laughs> I had wristwatch, but at 10 o'clock, you'd give it a flash. And then people better head for bed or get their candles or their flashlights or whatever. The kerosene lamps yeah. back out. Yeah. Okay. And I'd turn, the, I'd turn the switch off in five minutes. Okay, so people knew then, and, yeah. and uh, it was something that was uh, monitored, and this was the time that the electricity went off, and then the next morning this was the time you could depend on it to come on. Well, we'd, we'd start in the morning before the, they had the 5 o'clock whistle. The steam locomotive had the 5 o'clock whistle for people to get up. And I don't know why they, <laughs> they blew it at 5, but that was the time they blew the whistle and at that time the generators would be running. Okay. What, what kind of heating did the houses have, Clint? Usually they used wood stoves. Uh, Sir Roebuck and Monkey Ward both built nice cast iron stoves with uh, rising glass windows and you watch the fire. And, and, and these were, were these combination kind of cook stoves, heating stoves? Or no, the, the, heating, the heating stove was usually in the living room or or in that in between, mm -hmm. so it heat both rooms. Mm -hmm. The kitchen stove was usually a wood stove, also, and it contained the water pipes, you know, uh, to heat the water. Mm -hmm. People started having their own inside 
bathtubs and shower, shower more than anything, and they'd have a 90-gallon hot water tank hooked up to the wood range with, uh, uh, what do they call those pipes when they go into the stove? I don't know the name for it, but anyhow, yeah, it's just... Kind of a coil sort of thing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but I can't recall. That's what it is, a coil. Oh, okay, well, we'll go with that then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some of them were copper and some were steel pipe. Okay, so with these, this combination of these two types of stoves, it probably kept those houses pretty toasty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, because my parents ran a, a store, they didn't have time to maintain a, a wood stove and... We, we were uh, one of the first ones to get a dual-therm oil stove. Large dual-therm could put out 35,000, 40,000 BTUs. Yeah, and that, that saved the trouble of chopping your wood, or did, did the company supply chop wood? The company supplied my dad, but uh, at, that reminds me that uh, when we moved into that house that Bill Bear vacated, it had a wood furnace, hot air wood furnace mm. in the basement. And that was my job to keep that wood furnace going. And the company supplied the wood. The furnace was about 20 feet below the surface of the ground. And it had a concrete wood chute that was about eight feet square. They just throw down the chunks of four foot. Well, was that was that common? You talk about a basement uh, in an area where the houses are going to eventually be picked up and moved on. Did many folks have a basement? No, no. they had the root, the root houses, the root okay. house, where they kept their vegetables and mm -hmm. root and cellars. The, yeah, root yeah. cellars. Uh -huh. and, and were those those were common then? Yeah, they they were built right handy to the kitchen door. Okay, everybody had one? Yeah, almost everybody. Company built them? No, the, the individual built them, but the company would supply, say, old ties mm -hmm. to build the cribbing necessary. They were usually about six to eight feet below the surface of the ground. And how long and how wide would you say? Well, if you could uh, just use one They'd be real small if you just used one tie, so it'd be about 16 feet long and about 8 feet wide, because the tie was 8 feet long. What about the, the roof part? That was uh, sometimes, I mean, it was usually built with the two before's and uh, like any roof construction where you have the rafters and stuff, but uh, it was usually covered over with earth. Mm -hmm as an insulator. Okay, and th but this was something that that uh, each family had to construct themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. And there was a lot of them in the Lopine camp. Okay. But in the Lopine camp is where a new development came about. What was that? The portable uh, root cellar. A uh, fellow in Lopine, uh, Nick Myers, he built he had ties for the company. He started building these uh, Prefabricated. It was like you'd buy a, a a house built out of rough cut timber that had about four to six inches of sawdust insulation and a big door about a foot thick with huge hinges. And this building was about twelve by oh eight by twelve or maybe. Uh, 10 by 12, somewhere about that size, and about 8 feet tall. And it was constructed by Nick Myers and sold for $300. And so this, this became, in effect, the, the root house. Cellar. Yeah, okay. the root but cellar. It, but it, wasn't, it obviously wasn't subterranean. It set on the ground. Yeah, on skids, and okay. they moved it right with the rest, the rest okay. of the camp. Okay, so that developed in in the Lapine camp. Yeah. So if you were, you know, if I were to go out to the Lapine camp today and, uh, you know, look around and, and find places where houses might have been, yeah. I, I could expect to find uh, Holes, sunk, sunken yeah. features that had yeah. been root cellars. Yeah, most of the houses would have a, a, uh, a root cellar and uh, and, and that was next to the, the kitchen. The Lapine door. camp, I could show you 
my we had a concrete sidewalk in my basement and I can still show you that and I can show you a grease pit that uh, the Hodge brothers built a concrete grease pit where they uh, worked on automobiles mm -hmm. and that's still there right nobody's been able to get rid of that so though if if after Lapine camp we went down to summit camp would mm -hmm. we be likely to find uh, there'd be less root, root cellars there'd huh? be fewer root cellars and by the time we got to the Shamal camp the root cellars didn't hardly exist anymore they everybody was making do with the uh, above ground uh, a cooler in the type of uh, uh, above ground root cellar <laughs> okay well that's that's interesting to know because you know oftentimes you know when you're out doing these cultural resource surveys you're going from one camp to another and you don't always have the best uh, you know time period in mind and it, it's mm -hmm. nice to know that that with these root cellar features you might be able to date the camp a little bit better oh yeah yeah okay well that good that's nice okay uh, ask you one more thing here about the houses that comes to mind anyway uh, with the amount of people that were living out there uh, how did people dispose of their garbage that's where you find these big garbage pits okay no, tell me about them this the company would dig a huge garbage pit with a bulldozer and uh, there's a number of them around that, in fact, I covered a few of them. And they were usually within about a mile of camp. That cliff camp, I think they just threw it over that one cliff and the way it looks the last time I was out there. Well, oftentimes, you know, when, when I've been there, <coughs> within the camp itself, there seems to be, you know, large can dumps, uh, pits with, materials whether cans or bottles or ceramics or maybe some toys in them uh, within the the camp community we're yeah, talking about a slop hole a slop hole okay, yeah, they okay. Had tell each, me about each, a slop hole <laughs> each family had their own slop hole okay <laughs> and uh, it was a uh, a hole that they dug uh, that was about probably six feet square and about six feet deep and it had a cover a uh, wooden cover that fit over the top with a, uh, what would you call it, a, a, a type of uh, opening on the top that was built up about a foot high and it had a handle on it so you could take the cover off, like a hatch. Mm -hmm. It had a hatch that was built right square in the middle of this wooden six, six foot square pl uh, platform would be a two foot hole mm -hmm. and on that they'd go two feet high and then have a wooden top that fit right on top and and how deep were these slop holes about six feet about six feet deep and how wide six feet wide and so six feet. pretty good size yeah uh, <laughs> if you were there for an extended period of time they ever fill up oh once in a while yeah. that was one of the jokes that Millie Chop even at her funeral they brought that up that <laughs> Millie wanted to learn how to cook lemon meringue pie.